Our guest today, a defenseman who played 14 years in the NHL, Paul Martin, and the man who launched recovery community hockey, Saul Ryan. Joe Tilly's Great Canadian Sports Show, coming up! All right, our guest today, he hails from Elk River, Minnesota. He was a defenseman who played for the University of Minnesota, led the Golden Gophers to back-to-back -back NCAA titles. He was drafted in the second round by the New Jersey Devils. He was named to the U.S. Olympic team three times. He played 14 NHL seasons, 870 games with New Jersey, Pittsburgh, and San Jose. He is now a coach with the Minnesota Golden Gophers and founder of Shine a Light Foundation, Paul Martin. And also joining us from St. Paul, Minnesota, a recreational hockey player, the VP of Business Development for River Place Counseling Services, co-founder of Recovery Community Hockey, Saul Ryan. Guys, great to have you in the program. Now, some people might be wondering, uh, the great Canadian sports show, you're talking to two Americans today, but listen, we're talking about hockey, and what's more Canadian than that? And we're talking about recovery, which is, of course, universal. And by the way, Paul Martin, we used to call Paul we did highlights on the, on the show, the Honorable Paul Martin, because he has the same name of our former prime minister, which, Paul, you probably knew that, right? <laughs> I, I so, that. I... Yeah, yeah. So we're going to, uh, right, uh, Saul, we're going to bring you in, into the conversation in, in just a bit. But I want to, first of all, touch on some of Paul's career before we get into that. Uh, first of all, Paul, tell us about Elk River. I understand you're not the only NHL player who hails from Elk River, Minnesota. Yeah, Joe. So we have a pretty rich history of uh, of hockey players in uh, in Elk River. It started, I don't know if you know name, Joel Otto. He won a cup with the Flames. Mm. Yes, yes, sir. And then we have Dan Danny Hynote, who won a cup um, for the Colorado Avalanche. Uh, and Prosser had a long career with the Wild, myself. So definitely a lot of pride uh, in Elk River, Minnesota. Small small town with one gas station. Now it's kind of uh, the gateway to the to the north. So it's definitely grown. But something we take a lot of pride in, in in our small community right and we have you uh i think we have video of you playing some junior hockey in, in elk river Vic, if you can roll out we'll we chat a little bit here so you did mention that Otto and high note have uh, stanley cups uh, a little bit of jealousy going on here paul because uh, you know you you got so close right yeah, you know, I think that's the tough part when we measure ourselves and about what success looks like, you know, and as a hockey player in the NHL, if you don't have a Stanley Cup or get a thousand games, that's always tough to um, feel like you're somewhat of a, of a failure, haven't uh, made it to that next level. But really happy for those guys. They've, they've been good mentors to me in my career and always people that I've looked up to and, and have helped me on my journey. So I'm, I'm happy for them. And, um, you know, sometimes things just happen the way they're supposed to. Was hockey always going to be the sport for you? That's a good question. Played a lot of football and baseball. I was a three-sport athlete until um, going to college at the U and looking to maybe play football in college as well. But, you know, I, I skipped hockey uh, altogether in eighth grade and played basketball. We had a really good basketball team um, and won a state championship. But I realized skating on the summer or skating on the rink in the winter that I just missed hockey, you know, on the pond behind our house and, went back and played hockey uh, in ninth grade and then continued to have the success that I did. And so I feel like I made, uh, made the right choice. Yeah. It worked out. Okay. Yeah. Yes. That, that was probably a good decision. So, okay. So you were named Mr. Hockey Minnesota as a high schooler. Tell us about that uh, honor and how that came about and what that entails. Yeah. So the, the state of hockey is, as we call it, we give an award to the, the most outstanding, um, player the high school hockey season we have a lot of um, rich high school hockey here a lot of Minnesotans that have come through and have won the award so for for me to win that as as a senior was pretty special um, to be able to be um, honored to, uh, with that award it was cool like I, a lot of players have, have come before me to win that award so they uh, they still do it um, they continue to do that so it's it's a lot of fun um, and just grateful to have have that Right. And was it always going to be at the University of Minnesota as a landing ground in college? 
Yeah, I mean, it's changed so much. When I grew up, we'd go over to my grandma and grandpa's, grandpa how do's, and watch the Gophers, all sports. And, um, you know, from there, they were all on TV. Gophers were the main attraction when I was growing up. And now you have St. Cloud State, Mankato State, obviously North Dakota, and, and some other schools in the cities that um, compete. So for me to be able to go play for your home, um, home university growing up was really special for me. Um, you know, the Broughtons and the the Olams and the players that you, you watched growing up was uh, pretty cool just to wear the maroon and gold and then to have success while we were there was uh, was pretty special. Yeah, Neil Broughton, uh, always Minnesota for sure. So uh, you guys won back-to-back -back NCAA championships. Uh, we have a little bit of video of one of those right here. Do you remember this moment? Oh, yeah, here comes the Polish leap. Matt Kowalska, <laughs> he, uh, he ran right by me. He's trying to give him a hug, and there he goes. So, um, yeah, I mean, we were down. yeah, we were down, and just he ended up scoring with uh, a couple seconds left in our home barn at the Excel in our backyard. And, uh, you know, one of those storybook endings where we, I think we just had the, the hockey gods, a little little luck on our side. But I think just the uh, to be able to do that in front of our home crowd was was amazing in the aftermath of the celebration and the fun and was was so special and, and something that we we still spend a lot of time to this day our, our go for class um, alumni golf things like that just because of the success that we had. Yeah, I'm looking at your stats here from uh, from the university here uh, college. Uh, Forty four games, eight goals, thirty assists. One year, nine goals, thirty assists. The next year, rookie season, you were three three goals, seventeen twenty points in thirty eight games. So you had some offensive talent, and and that showed. I guess is one of the things that the, the Devils were looking for when they drafted you in the second round in 2000. Um, eventually joined the team full time in 2003, 2004. So they you, you were still in college, obviously, when they they drafted you. Uh, six goals as a rookie. Uh, do you remember this one here? I do remember that one. Look at those Christmas unis. Um, those are great. Um, <laughs> yeah. I came back from injury. I was out uh, for half of the year and and came back. Um, after a wrist injury and able to, to bury that one on my buddy flower. Um, so yeah, uh -huh. I, when you look back and think about the opportunities that you're given and, and Lou Lamarillo and the devils uh, drafting me, I think technically I was maybe the fourth pick they had in that draft because I was older for my age getting drafted out of high school. Um, so for them to have the uh, working with Larry Robinson, Jock LaPerriere, you know, what a couple of, stellar defenseman to learn from and Scott Stevens and Niedermeyer Rafalski. So what an organization and opportunity to come into and learn how to play the game um, from them. So grateful for that, that opportunity. Yeah. Your second season, 37 points in 80 games. Clearly you had that offensive ability and, and some speed as well. We have another goal. We're going to look at this is a game against Montreal uh, and you're, you're coming out of the penalty box right here. <laughs> yeah you guys are gonna make me look good if you just show like my four goals in the story. it's gonna be great yeah. Um, yeah so i mean i <laughs> played or play most of my career you know and then to get some second unit opportunities on certain teams was great and um i was you know known i think more for being a a, a defenseman but it's nice to have a little bit of some points to to help the team every once in a while Right, and there, the there you go. So I know it's number seven. Uh, you you were ten in college. Uh, what what made you transition to that particular number? Yeah, I mean, I don't think coming into New Jersey, I had you have much say as to what you know kind of goes on. You're you know you have short hair, and I was thirty eight yeah. in three seasons. When they wanted me to stick around, they're like, "Here's number seven. So I was like, "Okay, I'll take it." And oh. uh, that was the number the rest of of my career, and ended up being you know. Um, a number that I liked originally, so it didn't make that much of a difference. But yeah, I didn't have too much of a say uh, <laughs> for what I wanted coming in as a as a rookie. Yeah, uh, playing for Lou Lamorello, you did what Lou said, you, you got what Lou gave you, right? That's kind of the way. <laughs> that's kind of the way it was, right? Pretty much. So uh, yeah, so you're uh, you left Jersey to sign with the Penguins as an unrestricted free agent, five years, twenty five million dollars. Uh, not bad for a college blue liner from Elk River. I'm thinking we're at this particular time. Are you one of the wealthiest guys in, in Elk River? Here's a nice little hip check. Yeah, that's my one hip check that you got. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> yep, I'm going to raise the puck here in the upper corner. Jock 
LaPierre yeah. always, when I came back to the bench after I shot, would say, you shoot like, and then he'd put a swear word on it and we'd have to work on the <laughs> shot. Afterwards. So, um, but yeah, I mean, coming to Pittsburgh was great. Like, I think we talked about Stanley cups, right. And wanting to win. And, and, uh, they had just won one in Pittsburgh in 09, I believe. And so to go there with, you know, Tang Crosby, uh, flower, um, you know, Malkin to have that opportunity was, you know, in the back of my, by my head. And, uh, we didn't end up getting, um, that cup in the five years that I was there, but made some friends and, and really learned to grow, to love the city of Pittsburgh. It was hard at first, but then it really grew on me and the people and, and, um, and playing there. Well, you didn't get cup, but you did have some playoff success uh, in 2013 against the Islanders. And we have another Paul Martin goal. This is the one that tied the game. And then you guys went on to win this game in overtime to clinch the series. How cool is it to be part of something like that? So cool. That was, uh, yeah, one of my biggest goals. And I'm glad that you show it like that, because if you show it in slow motion, that chips off, I think, Nielsen stick in front and goes upstairs. But you can't tell that when you put it in full time. <laughs> so, oh, no, show it in slow motion. Down, <laughs> so it, he tips it and uh, goes right over the oh, shoulder. Yeah. Uh, but, hey, it counts. So, yeah, that was pretty special. And, um, you know, there's nothing that beats – playoff hockey and just watching it this year has been a lot of fun there's still some guys playing that i that i played with so just to be able to contribute for the team and, and that um that moment was a lot of fun and something i'll always remember now you know what it was, it was clear to me that you were playing it off the islander stick into the top you know it's pretty obvious yeah. <laughs> I should have. Yeah. Yeah. so on, onward we we joined the the uh, sharks for four years and almost 20 million dollars those are some pretty nice contracts and uh, and as a member of the San Jose Sharks, you were mic'd up for a game against the Penguins. And we, we're going to run a little bit of that because it's quite, I found it quite fascinating. One coming. Rivers right up there. Teddy, wall. Yeah. There we go. There's an apple. Way to move there. <laughs> the Where do you go? Heavy. With the mic on, that too. That's it. pressure. Yeah, you just got to pass it over to Burn to you and find a way to get it to the net, you know? Yeah. He's good at So, so what, do, yeah. what do you think when you when you look at yourself and you hear yourself talk in, in this game and, and uh, well, what's going on? Oh. Yeah, penalty. <laughs> this is over the box. <laughs> my stick right at him. Hit Come my on, straight. Oh, well. Right into him. Yeah. You know, they're not always going to get them all right. Right. So. Um, yeah, that was a fun game returning to Pittsburgh after, um, you know, five, five years. And then I know we ended up making it to the cup finals that year, which was pretty incredible making a run in San Jose. And of course we, we lined up against Pittsburgh. So that was a tough, a tough loss that really took, um, a lot out of me, you know, when you're, that's kind of one of your, um, aspirations is to win a Stanley cup and you fall short to your old team. Um, that was difficult for me. Um, a good experience, a tough, tough experience, but yeah, not easy. So that's, you know, I want to get to that. So we're, we're, um, you know, uh, you talk about me being a tough experience and things did get tough for you. I know there were injuries and, and of course, uh, you know, uh, uh, and, and it led to some, some issues with, 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 with alcohol and drugs. And so, so how bad it, did it get for you? Where, where were you at that, you know, at that bottom piece? Yeah. I mean, I think the end of my career in San Jose and going into being bought out in the retirement, the last, you know, year, a uh, year and a half, most the, the last six months after my retirement was the, the toughest. I think once you lose that piece of identity of who you are as, as a human and, and at least what I perceived as a hockey player, um, mm -hmm. you know, to an end after so many years of that's being who you were and how you brought value and just realizing that like mentally and physically, like you said, injuries, the, the expectations, the demands of on my body with numerous um, and periods of length being out of the lineup um, just kind of took a toll, you know, on me. And there was by the end of my career in San Jose, I, even though I had, I loved being at the rink with the guys, the teammates, they really kind of keep you going. And that's what I miss the most is, is the guys in the locker room, you know, playing the game uh, with them. But it became something where that became a place I didn't want to be. Uh, I was in San Jose. The weather was nice and warm outside, but I was isolated, you know, lonely inside 
my place. And at that point I had ankle surgery, um, before the, my last year and they put my ligaments back together and was taking opiates and pain meds and, and drinking, um, you know, to the point where it had, I had to continue to maintain, um, you know, my, what I thought was my health to maintain my, um, ability to, to function and, and regulate getting to the rink and traveling. And, and there were bouts and they, um, had spoken to Doug Wilson at the beginning of that year and said that I was, you know, that was one of my biggest, I think when you say re- regrets was not being able to tell Doug, like I needed help mm. uh, and say, you know, I'm not doing well when I said, yeah, things um, I'm just, you know, dealing with some things right now, but I'll figure it out. And obviously that that's not the case as you know, um, you know, so to be able to say, you know, I needed help with something I wish I would have done sooner, even though it took what it take to get to that point where through the half of that year I was, you know, worked with some other people to um get back on the ice and regain my strength and play some of my better hockey. But by the end of the year I just didn't have enough of um you know recovery in me to to know um what I was capable of. So by the end of year in San Jose getting uh, bought out and then just kind of really falling more into a deeper uh depression. Um, you know, my mental health suffered and and not really wanting to see anyone or be around anybody. Um, you know, there was definitely some shame and guilt that went along with that. And so it was a long, you know, year there. And, um, you know, I did struggle, you know, part of the lifestyle, the drinking and stuff throughout my career and, and some, you know, depression and and some loneliness, like it gets to be, I think people realize like the expectations and the demands of playing hockey at a high level, um, have a lot of pressure and can be demanding, especially when you feel like you're kind of on your own going through that process. But, um, it really, um, yeah, kind of came to a head after I was bought out the last, after the last year of my, um, contract in San Jose. Yeah. You know, I mean, it would have been great if you, you mentioned it would have been nice to be able to say to Doug Wilson at that particular time that, yes, I have a problem and, and, uh, and, you know, things, you know, could have, could have nipped things in the butt, I suppose, but. You know, at this point, I think I want to bring in Saul into the into the conversation as well. So we're getting right into into your into your belly with your Saul as well. So, uh, you know, but for whatever reason, I think it is. It just is what it is. We have our our, our bottoms that that uh, we need to get to in order for us to be willing to do what it takes to change. You know, because I look at there's points in in my life when I could have said, you know, um, I got a problem. Could have reached out you know, before I lost the next thing, you know, before I lost the next thing and, and that type, and that type of, uh, of thing. But, you know, it, it wasn't until I was, you know, hit the bottom that I needed to, to hit, you know, before I was will, willing to really do what it takes. And, you know, for me, go to treatment and, and, and then, and then, you know, do what, it, do, do what it takes to change. But, you know, one of the things, like you talked about the camaraderie in hockey and, and everything like that. And, and, uh, and, and, and so, you know, you, you have this, the, the recovery community hockey uh, program, which you launch, which is un- incredible. And, uh, and really you, you, you have that right now, now you can see how you can have that. But in my mind, right. I, I'm thinking when I got sober, well, there's, that's the end of fun. Well, there goes fun in my life because I always associated fun with drinking and partying and, you know, that type of thing. And how can I possibly have fun without, without doing that? And, and so, was that was that a part problem for you, Paul, or something similar? Yeah, I mean, I think for sure the I mentioned touched on the the lifestyle. Like, I think you know, coming into the the league, um, you know, that was pretty apparent that that was just part of the way that that it was um, to be able to just um, you know kind of fit in and be a part of the group, and um, you know, and and the travel and the demands and um, ways to cope through the. Um, you know, just through the, through the season and to get through it. And I think, you know, by the end of realizing that that's part of like who you are and then going through the recovery process and getting sober and, you know, how, who am I without that? How am I going to have fun? How do I go to a bar and not drink? How do I, you know, make friends, build relationships? I feel like that is definitely a fear that I had, especially early on in, in recovery. And so a lot of that, I think, changed spending, spending time with people that were doing the same thing that I was doing, um, 
wanting the same things that I wanted, you know, had values that started to align with me as I started to realize like what I wanted and what was important to me. And, and you kind of learn who your real friends are um, as far as that, um, you know, want the best for you that, you know, love you no matter what and, and are, are happy for your growth and, and your journey. And so I think that just takes time. Like I just got back from a fish show um, at the, in Vegas at the sphere, you know, sober with some buddies that have changed over time, which, you know, for the music, it was incredible and the lights and, and the, the show, which before, you know, I got sober, that wasn't even be possible, you know, anxious, even going to the, um, the concert, knowing that I was sober. Like, so I feel like all of that is possible over time, you know, working a program and surrounding yourself with the right people. Yeah. And so, uh, I, first, can you just touch on your story a little bit and, 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 and how you found your way to the rooms and what, uh, what you, why you wanted to start recovery uh, community hockey? Sure. Well, I want to, I want to start with just saying that uh, it's, it's really incredible because in, in no other uh, realm would it make sense for me to be uh, pictured next to Paul Martin um, you know, so this recovery journey is is such a such a wonderful, amazing ride that uh, you know I just continue to be in awe. Um, you know, so I I got sober August 16, two thousand eight, and I grew up as a you know as a kid who loved playing hockey, and I you know I played uh, up until after Bantam, so I never even played high school hockey. But you know, after I got sober uh, about 10, 10 years ago, I got back into playing hockey. And it was something that was uh, just a renewed passion and I had always loved. And so uh, I started playing with this, uh, with this sober team called the, the St. Paul 35ers. And not that uh, we were old guys, but uh, some of us were. But uh, it was the year uh, the team was named the, the year that AA started, 1935. Oh, and right. we were sitting around after, we were sitting around after a, uh, after a game one time and we were, we were talking and, <clears throat> you know, they said, uh, how, how does, uh, how is there not a sober skate in Minnesota? You know, it was the, you know, we joke we're the land of 10,000 lakes, but we're the land of 10,000 treatment centers. And as Paul mentioned, you know, we're the state of hockey and, um, you know, out of, out of Canada, I mean, Minnesota is a, a really big hockey hub, you know, and, and it, it didn't exist. And we thought, you know, maybe we could start this uh, weekly pickup skate and we could uh, create a connection point in the community uh, for, you know, people who are in recovery. And yeah, I mean, it's about hockey, but it's about something larger and it's about community and connection. And so I said, guys, I think I can put some work time to this. And, you know, so uh, Doug Anderson and, and Ryan Canoy and I, uh, you know, put our heads together and we uh, we launched Recovery Community Hockey and and we got sponsors to pay for the ice time and and it's uh, it's led to something that we could have only dreamed uh, was possible, you know and that that led to uh, a connection with Jared Jenkins who uh, who works uh, for the Minnesota Wild and he uh, came to the skate and said hey guys I, I really would love to do uh, uh, you know a recovery night a sober night and you know have a meeting before a game and and then everybody go to the game and you know. You think we can get 50 people? And I said, yeah, we, we can get 50 people. And so we got, we got 200 and then uh, it ended up, uh, you know, being a, a big success. And, and then, uh, you know, we said, Jared, I, I think we can, you know, we, we think we can really make this something uh, even bigger and we can bring in uh, some, some retired uh, NHLers. And so we brought in Derek Sanderson the next year for the second annual Minnesota Wild Recovery Night. You know, Derek Sanderson being a, a, a legend out uh -huh. in Boston and um, long-term sober guy. And, and so we, we grew it from 200 to 500. And then it's just been, uh, been a really incredible journey from there. Yeah. So uh, I want to, Vic, I want to roll uh, some of the video that uh, I've seen you from the, uh, the, the recent event in Minneapolis. This was the third event. And of course, uh, Paul was there. He was your, your keynote that, that, that particular night. Uh, the Minnesota Wild, as you mentioned, um, l let's have a look at some of the uh, some of the video from from that event that, that you sent to me. So this is pretty uh, pretty impressive, you know, starting from what you thought would be 50 people and uh, 
turning into something like this. And, and uh, you know, the silver, silver community out in droves. And, you know, this is pretty much a testament to, uh, you know, what you can do when you, you know, when you start focusing, you know, things in the, in the right direction. And, uh, you know, how has your life changed? Like, like, tell, like, talk about the soul before to the soul now and, and being part of this. Well, so, so this was actually our sixth annual Minnesota Wild Recovery Night. And Sorry, I'm so sixth, over, sixth, yeah, yeah. This is our sixth, yes. Yeah. So, so this is the sixth annual, and we had over 1,900 people um, come to that event and, and sold that many tickets as well. So uh, the, the great the great Polly Martin is a big draw uh, in Minnesota, uh, and yeah. uh, he, he did just an incredible, incredible job with that. And, you know, my... For for me, uh, you know, my my life has changed in in such a way that uh, dreams are are coming true. You know, I uh, I always loved uh, professional sports and hockey growing up, and you know now through this lens of recovery um, that we've been able to uh, make it about community and connection. And yeah, I mean it's it's about you know coming to hear these uh, you know these guys who we hold up in in these big positions and, and we, we look up to them. Uh, but for me, it's what's really powerful is, is when, when there's uh, you know, when, when Paul was earlier talking about what it was like for him in that final year, you know, I, I can't relate to uh, playing in a Stanley cup final game, uh, right. Cup close. Uh, but I can, I can really relate to that. And uh, so it's, it's uh, you know, for me, incredible gifts have, have come because of recovery yeah and one thing i can relate to with paul for sure is that shame and loneliness and guilt that i felt beforehand and and, and you know and being having a chance to live life the way i think i was meant to be uh now um so but this is this is crazy because it, it's gotten so big uh i, I wanted to talk to you about that there's a growing movement it caught my attention on on linkedin and there's there's a tampa bay recovery night uh you know that was Austin Watson of the Lightning was 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 in for that. Look at that sold out recovery community hockey, fantastic event there. Then uh, David Devin Seven uh took center stage with the message for San Jose Sharks Night. Uh, how was Devin? Uh, Devin Devin was uh, was incredible, and uh, you know thanks to. Thanks to Paul for for that uh, introduction, and you know when when we get these um, these guys uh, who have had these careers, but then are also now have had their lives transformed in building this foundation and recovery. And um, I could I could just feel uh, Seto's uh, you know his uh, his excitement to be there in in that capacity. Um, you know, so it's it's really been this thing now where I mean it grew from from Minnesota to, so this last year we went to Nashville. Um, Dan Kesmer was our main speaker there. Uh, then we went to, uh, then we went to New Jersey and uh, the, the legend, uh, Ken Danico, Mr. Devil himself was our speaker there. And then, um, then we went to, uh, then we went to San Jose where we had Devin Setaguchi. Then we went to Tampa and uh, where we had, um, where we had uh, Austin, uh, speak, which was uh, pretty incredible that, that he was willing to record a video for us that day, even though he was uh, getting ready to play in the game. And, you know, that to me, there's this, um, there's this brotherhood and there's this commitment and this community aspect in, in recovery that is, that, that it's tough to fully explain, but when you, when you experience it, you, you feel it. Yeah, and you it's and you've extended now in, in, into basketball. You know the Timberwolves held the night, which was fantastic, uh, and uh, and uh, you know now you're talking about uh, 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 was um, oh yeah Willie Burton was on hand for that one, Willie Burton and 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 the Timberwolves on hand. So uh, also a University of Minnesota grad, uh, Paul. So there you go. Uh, so this is uh, clearly it, it, it's something that's uh, it's starting to extend into other areas and and you know i know that in in canada here we have something called the coffee cup a guy that i sponsor is involved in that and and uh and they have uh, that thing has grown by leaps and bounds and and it, it continues to grow uh 
just not quite yet as organized as this is. And, and uh, you know, back when I first got sober, which is a few years ago, I played for a, a sober team. We were the uh, we were sponsored by a coffee uh, coffee shop, and uh, and and uh, we well most of us were sober. Sometimes you know things happen, but uh, it was it's pretty crazy, and and we we were pretty crazy. But you know, like I know that now what happens is when things get out of hand, they stop, they blow the whistle, everybody gets in a circle, you know. And, and they, they say the serenity prayer or something along those lines. And uh, it, it, it's pretty cool. I mean, <laughs> wish we could do that in, in a real game sometimes, but uh, yeah, <laughs> slow down the tempo a little bit, but pretty cool. Uh, and and uh, uh, I, I wanted to also, uh, Paul, you're involved in something else. that You, you had the foundation for, for a while now. Tell us about the Shine the Light Foundation. And the light, the T in light is... is uh, the number seven is pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. So, Shine I mean, we, yes, in 2016, a uh, youth mental health awareness and education um, organization um, providing funds to Masonic Children, uh, HCMC, Washburn Center for Children in the area for youth mental health, therapeutic um, resources, et cetera. Um, recently, we've um, started to fund the music therapy programs at Masonic so that kid through those those doors and spend time in the hospital have an opportunity to learn music, um, record songs, express their emotions through music or art, um, things of that nature. We also have some um, a mental fitness program, we call it, to work with some of the, the high schools in the area that do um, work with gratitude, um, mindfulness meditation, breath work, visualization, leadership work, et cetera, just to, so the kids can learn, you know, some of those life lessons that maybe they're not learning in the classroom. So that's something we just had an event, the Soul Shine event uh, a couple Thursdays ago to raise some funds with some bands in the area. Um, it went really well. So just something that, you know, when I came back from, from my mental health journey, when I stepped away from the foundation and just realized how important this need was, especially in the community, uh, to serve our youth and just give them the tools and resources so they can, um, you know, find their light and, and strive, um, you know, to live healthy lives. So that's just something since I've been sober, I've been committed, recommitted to um, in the area and, and working on. And, and just to comment on Saul and the work that he's doing is just incredible. And just for them to 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 be a part of it was pretty special and see the the growth of what what that is, you know, in, in Minnesota here and, and the people that have come out of the woodwork to um you know, uh, just see what the, the surprise sobriety thing is and, um, and learn about it. And it's, it's, the growth has been amazing and a testament to, to Saul and the work that they're doing. Yeah. Yeah. I got this line in my head tells me that you can't have fun in sobriety and, it, you know, it's going to be a boring life and yada, 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 yada. Uh, and, and, and the exact opposite is true. And you, you know, you talked about your foundation, including art and music and all aspects. So, I mean, there's so many different ways that we can, have fun in recovery. And when I talk about having fun, I have way more fun today than I ever did before <laughs> recovery. I mean, I sort of thought I was having fun and I called it fun, but you know, it was stupid junk that I you know, <laughs> was involved with. So um, I want to talk about a big silver event coming up in Durham region that's coming up next month because it, you talked about Paul going to the sphere with your buddies and seeing some concerts and bands involved in your foundation. And, uh, this is called the Celebrating, uh, Re Celebrate, Relate, Relating in Recovery Day, Sober Palooza, Southern Ontario's most exciting sober party of the summer. It's June 22nd at the Biltmore Theater in Oshawa. I will be there. I'll be involved with that. It's an all day, all night dry fundraiser featuring performances by Helen Back, Simply Skinner, Madhouse, Valier, and Mickey O'Brien. Proceeds to Alpha House and the Backdoor Mission. Get your tickets today for Silverpalooza at BiltmoreTheater.com, and we'll we'll see you we'll see you there. So, Paul, uh, again, like uh, I gotta want to have a hockey question. I want to ask you. You played for the likes of, you know, the Penguins, the Devils. Even people you played with people like Brodeur and Sid Crosby and Brent Burns. And who was the most impressive player that you ever played with, or maybe against too? Yeah, I mean that's a good question. I love that sober palooza, by the way. I'll have to check out on the calendar. That looks like a, a great time. That's awesome. I love that. Um, Come on, good down. question. Yeah. Up. yeah, there's there's so many. Um, you know, I think just Sidney Crosby, the way that he 
um, carries himself, you know, even in practice and his performance, um, just the standard he sets as far as the work that he puts in. Um, it's hard to place anyone near him. I think when you talk about, you know, goaltending, Broder, and to be able to play with Flurry, you know, two in the top three mm. as far as wins, et cetera. Like, I just thinking about how fortunate I've been. Like, to me, Scott Niedermeyer was, I think, the best player, like, in my eyes as a defenseman to be able to, to watch and learn from um, just how talented he was and how good of a skill he was. And just very underrated, even for all his accolades. You know, I'd put him, you know, at the top as a defenseman. But then to go to San Jose and play with Joe, with Jumbo, like, uh, just – to be able to pass like that and put the numbers up that he does and just the great teammate that he is, you know, and leader. Um, so, and Burnsy, you know, to see him win a Norris uh, and be part of that was pretty special. So like, there's been a lot of really good players, you know, Patrick Eliash and Scotty Gomez and um, to be able to play with. So just when you talk about three organizations that have had success and some really um, good talent, I'm sure I'm missing, you know, quite a few names, but, I'm pretty fortunate to play with with the likes of those guys. I mean, Scotty Stevens was my first partner to be able to be with Mm. him for half a year. Um, You know, um, so yeah, those are like Chris Letang, who's going to be, you know, in the Hall of Fame, I feel. So um, yeah, pretty, pretty fortunate to play with some of those guys. Yeah, no question. Letang's the first ballot Hall of Famer. Saul, uh, the the recovery community hockey, um, what's next? What's on the horizon? Well, uh, first, I'm, I'm going to see if we can get Paul to join us, and we're going to come up and compete in the coffee cup. Uh, I don't, I don't know if that's <laughs> legal, but uh, but but we'll, we'll put together a few guys. Um, you know, we we um, we are just. I tell you, we're incredibly honored to be part of something that is a movement. And you know, one thing we recognized early on was that. You know, we didn't necessarily create something. We just are cooperating with something that's always been there. And we're just really fortunate to be at a time where, you know, you have more and more guys in the league coming out and talking about their their struggles and being open about their their sobriety and the courage that it takes to, you know, I remember being being concerned about talking about you know, my, my own recovery openly. And, you know, I, I couldn't even imagine to be somebody who's, um, you know, has a, has a super significant Wikipedia page, right. And, and everybody knows them and, and yet, you know, having that courage to come out and talk about, um, their, their struggles, because to me, everybody has, you know, everybody has something. And even if it's not necessarily drugs or alcohol or, or recovery, I mean, everybody, has gone through something in their life. And, you know, so this, this recovery community hockey movement that's happening is, um, is really powerful. And, you know, we're, we're looking to, um, and are already in talks with, with several other, other teams. And, you know, our, our hope is that this uh, becomes a, a league wide initiative and it, uh, it grows to, to all the league, uh, all the teams in the league. And, you know, it's a, it's an opportunity to, celebrate recovery it's an opportunity to uh you know to bring in shine a light but shine a light on on the successes you know and and that there is an incredible community around uh around uh the the recovery um aspect in our in our cities you know and one thing i've noticed is that uh, people in recovery they show up um the other thing that we've started to see is that uh, there are there are friends and family members who are, are coming out and and they're supporting uh, their loved ones who who are in recovery. And you know, to me, uh, it, it's about uh, it's about an entire community. And you know, the the praying moms and dads and the friends that that supported a lot of us along the way are are the reason why a lot of us are are sober today. Yeah, you talked about the courage piece. You know, I used to think that you know, never showing weakness was what courage was all about. But what I found is like, when we talk about our, our, you know, our frailties, our weaknesses and, and, and share that, that's truly courage. And that's what we, we learn from and that's what we grow from. And that's, uh, you know, that to me, that's what rockets us into a fourth dimension of existence. 
talk about. Uh, I have, before you go, I, I have a question I always like to ask my guests and call you first. Uh, what's the best advice you've ever received? Ooh, the best re- advice I've ever received. I mean, I feel like I'm a big quote person. Um, and the one I'm into recently is I think the only way out is through, and I don't know if that's Robert Frost. Um, and I think that just was correlating to what you kind of talked about, about, you know, going, having fear and going through our journey. I mean, I also like, um, I think it's Marcus Aurelius, like the quality of life is determined by the quality of our thoughts. And some of that I think is very, um, apparent in my, my brain and and how I think about myself and in my journey. So I feel like, um, the, the biggest thing is just, yeah, I think the only way out is, is through is to be able to, um, you know, ask for help if you need it, um, to, to do the work, you know, on yourself, um, to heal and then to be able to continue on that, that path to help other people. Awesome. Uh, feel the fear and do it anyway. Do that fourth and fifth, man. It's worth it. Saul, same question. What's, what's the best advice you've ever received? Well, the, the thing that immediately popped into my, my head was, uh, my, my former boss, uh, John Curtis at, at the retreat, uh, before. So I worked for the retreat before I worked for River Place Counseling Centers. And, um, uh, he, he once told me the, the single greatest thing I could do for my career development was to continue to enlarge my spiritual condition. And for me, that, that has always stayed with me. And what I, what I see is that, uh, the goal that I thought I set, uh, for myself to achieve is, is really, uh, you get there, um, through a different way and it becomes, uh, being, uh, it becomes a lot more meaningful. And, uh, so I'm just very grateful. Yeah. All, all those things I thought I wanted when I, when I first got sober, right. Uh, nothing compared to what I got. Right. It's pretty cool. Um, okay. Paul saw great to have you guys on the show. Uh, uh, Paul, uh, Paul, we didn't touch on it, but you're coaching now at, at the university of Minnesota and, and, uh, good luck with the golden gophers, go gophers and, uh, good luck with the team and good luck in your you know future endeavors, wh- whatever they are involved in terms of coaching. And, and Saul, of course, good luck with, uh, with uh, recovery community hockey. I really appreciate you guys being here. It's been fun. I really like this kind of a show. Works for me. And, uh, and hopefully we can reach some people. Yeah. Thanks. Thank, Thank you, you Joe. It, it's been an incredible honor. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you sir. And uh, more when we come back. Thanks. Addiction Rehab Toronto, Toronto's number one alcohol and drug treatment center, saving lives, reuniting families. The only treatment center in the province to offer medical detox, treatment, sober living, and lifetime aftercare all in one place. Our unique and specialized programs are designed to equip our clients with the tools to successfully lead a life of dignity, respect, and purpose. Let us help save your life or your loved one's life Call today for more information or to facilitate an intervention. 1-855-787-2424 or visit addictionrehabtoronto.ca. Rely on Walton Restoration's 40-plus years of excellence in residential and commercial restoration. Their strong reputation is built on workmanship, professionalism, and outstanding customer service. Trust Walton as your dependable partner in emergencies serving Durham, Kawartha, and Northumberland regions. Call 905-725-5666 or visit waltonrestoration.com. Experience top-tier workmanship and service. Walton Restoration, the trusted name in property restoration. Join satisfied customers like me. And we want to thank all the folks who make the show possible. These are friends, trusted business associates, and all-around great people. We highly recommend the ball. Thank you for your support of Canadian and local sports. A reminder that the show is also available on iTunes, Spotify, Breaker, Radio Public, Google Podcasts, and Pocket Cast, as well as the Spanglish Network, Buzz TV Live, and Zingo TV. Also, check out all the latest shows on YouTube. All of our past great shows are on there, clips and shorts. Like and subscribe. It's absolutely, positively, incredibly free.
Thanks once again to Paul Martin and Saul Ryan for being on the program. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next time. Brian Gribben Insurance Planning, helping you solidify your financial future. At BGIP, what we do that's unique in the marketplace is we show people how to spend and enjoy their money in their early years of retirement without the fear of running out. Also, we're able to do this without you having to change financial advisors. Please look us up at bgip.ca today. Let's book a 30-minute phone call to see how we can bring value to you and your family in your planning. Call Brian today for all your retirement needs. We did. 905-686-5678. MNP, a leading Canadian national accounting, tax, and business accounting firm. MNP proudly serves and responds to the need of their clients in the private, public, and nonprofit sectors. Through partner led engagements, MNP provides a collaborative, cost effective approach to do business and personal strategies to help people and organizations to succeed across the country and around the world. With local offices in Oshawa, Mississauga, Burlington, and more. Their team is here to support you. Visit mnp.ca today to learn more. Rooted in 60 years of tradition, Sleepy Hollow is a private golf club with a friendly community of members just minutes from Toronto. With mature trees and rolling fairways, Sleepy Hollow provides a challenging and enjoyable experience for passionate golfers. Enjoy great golf, amazing dining, and a picturesque patio second to none. Visit SleepyHollowCountryClub.com. Joe Tilly here. My wife Penny Claire and I recently took an amazing trip to Egypt and Jordan with Trip Oppo. And here are our top 10 must do's. Last but not least, we relaxed at a luxury resort and took a dip in the famous Dead Sea. This beautiful resort was a perfect way to cap off our incredible adventure in Egypt and Jordan. After days of exploring ancient ruins and bustling markets, it was wonderful to just kick back, put on a little mud, and soak up the sun by the Dead Sea. Oh, I almost forgot to mention the amazing cuisine in Egypt and Jordan. Don't forget to try the delicious local food like mouth-watering Egyptian barbecue. And the best part is that our trip Oppo tour includes almost all of the meals, so you can indulge in the local cuisine without worrying about opening your wallet. I would highly recommend that you book your next trip through Trip Oppo. Call them today. Guests on Joe Tilly Sports receive a gift certificate from Classica Imports. Top of the line imported men's clothing. Check out the Classica Essential Collection now. Go to shopclassica.com.